Verse 23, Luke 2, verse 20, excuse me, verse 25. Now, there was in Jerusalem a man named Simeon, an upright, devout man. He was expecting to see the consolation of Israel, and he was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that there were, so to speak, little people, even in those days, before the Spirit of God was poured out on the church, that God was speaking to personally. And Simeon was one of them. It just simply says that there was a man in Jerusalem, and he was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In verse 26, he'd received personal revelation, which, of course, is the genius of the New Covenant, which we talked about last night. That's the only way we know the secrets of the New Covenant, and I can't emphasize that strongly enough, is by personal revelation. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not die without seeing the Lord's Messiah. That was a great revelation. So under the Spirit's guidance, he went into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus there to do for him as the custom of the law required, Simeon also took him in his arms and blessed God. Now notice how this is what Carl Jung calls synchronicity when external circumstances come together to confirm what God has told you internally. One of those pieces of marvelous timing which happen periodically. Judy and I were talking about that a bit at breakfast this morning. We heard a good story about that the other day again, how God just brings people to the right place at precisely the right time. And that's the case with Simeon. He just, quote, happened, unquote, to be in the temple at the right time when Jesus arrived for circumcision with his parents. And so he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Master, you will let your slave go free in peace as you have promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared before all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, or the heathen, and a glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother kept wondering at the things spoken by Simeon about him. Then Simeon gave them his blessing and said to Mary, the child's mother, This child is destined to bring the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign continuously disputed. Now note the next words, please. Yea, a sword will pierce your heart. Not a very pleasant message. So that the secret purposes of many hearts will be revealed. A sword will pierce your heart so that the secret purposes of many hearts will be revealed. Now I had a, about an hour's fellowship with the Lord last evening, and this is the direction he gave me. On February 5th of this year, and this is my 1985 journal, I'd like to strongly recommend to those of you who are on a spiritual quest that you keep a journal. It's an excellent idea. There's no way anyone can keep in mind, without writing it down, the things that God gives us. And I have been blessed and re-blessed and a million times blessed by being led of the Spirit back into the journal. Now, the odd thing is that I haven't looked at the journal for quite some period of time, except to write small entries, because I've been reading some excellent books that God's given me. But last night, he directed me back to this journal. And on February 5th, I had this dream. Now, I enter rhema words that God gives, dreams, visions, what have you, in this journal, whatever the Lord sends. I also carry in the back side of it some letters that the Lord sends from others that are particularly anointed that he wants me to keep for reference. And so in this dream, on the treeless summit, high in the Rocky Mountains, now we live in the Rocky Mountains, and we've always wanted to, and now we do, and God gives you the desires of your heart. We live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is a fantastic place, and of course very famous, uh, and wherever you come into Jackson Hole from any direction, you always see a sign with a finger pointing this way. And it says, Howdy, partner. Yonder lies Jackson Hole, the last and best of the Old West. 
And that's really what it is, and we really enjoy living there. And of course, just five minutes from our condominium is the Grand Tetons. And uh, just the most magnificent mountain range, I think, in North America. And so we live in the Rockies. So this dream had to do with the Rockies, and on the treeless summit, after you get up above the tree line, high in the Rocky Mountains, and there was another man there, walking over the high places, I discover magnificent, <laughs> luscious, beautiful grapes growing hidden in the cleft of the rock. Now, <clears throat> this is what I put down for the meaning given. <coughs> I have climbed to the high places and found the new wine the grapes of Eskel, hidden in the rock where Moses was hidden when the glory passed by. Do you remember that? God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and covered him with his hand while his glory passed by. Now these grapes were growing down under the rock and they were the most beautiful grapes I've ever seen. Big, big grapes. The best fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, the wine of the kingdom. On returning to bed, I took up at Hebrews 8.1 in reviewing my memorization. And God impressed this on my heart. You remember he told Moses, and it says this in Hebrews 8, See thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Remember that? See that you make everything according to the pattern that I revealed to you in the mount. Now this is a pattern that God revealed to me in the mount. And in Hebrews 3, he deals with it. He says, for example, of the Jews in Moses' day who failed to enter Canaan, which is a picture of failing to go on in our spiritual growth. He said they do always err in their hearts, in their unconscious, in their deep being, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest because they just absolutely refused to go on and believe in a continuing salvation is what it amounted to. They had faith to get out of Egypt, but they didn't have faith to walk in and take the land. And they didn't have faith because they weren't willing to receive personal revelation. Remember what they said at Mount Sinai, don't let God speak to us anymore. And when you say that, you cut off personal revelation because they couldn't endure that which was commanded. Now, Hebrews 8 ends on a very happy note, not on that kind of note. And it says, I will put my laws in their mind and write it in their hearts. And Ephesians 4, 16 and 17 is especially a challenge to Christians and it's written to good Christians, so it's a possibility for anybody. And he says to those uh, really Zenith type Christians who were uh, at the peak of spiritual development in Paul's day, he said, uh, don't walk like other Gentiles walk, like the unsaved in other words, in the emptiness of their mind or spirit, having their understanding darkened, being cut off from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their hearts. This is a heart matter, in other words. And a Christian can be cut off from the life of God, now not lose his salvation, I'm not talking about that for a minute, but be cut off existentially or experientially, moment by moment in his daily walk, as the Israelis in the wilderness were from the life of God through the ignorance that's in him because his heart is blind. Now what makes for blindness of heart? Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to mention this too, that you know and the well-known uh, challenge in Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, for in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And in one of the many places in the New Testament, it's likened uh, the Spirit's fullness to being drunk or under the influence of something else. And he says, be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is wine? Remember what I saw in the high places in the mountain in the dream, were grapes hidden in the cleft of the rock, where Moses saw the glory of God. These were glory grapes. But the wine comes from crushed grapes from pressed grapes, the wine press. Now that's a little different theme, and most of us don't like that theme. And it says in Philippians 1.28, and God really impressed this on me when I was studying, when he gave me these things, 
For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Now, there's one thing that universally I think we do not like, naturally speaking, and that's the theme of suffering, testing, tribulation, being tried. I don't like that. I fight that. But it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's a reality principle. And it's a reality principle in the kingdom of God. When you're in your elemental stages, God protects you from a lot of that. Just like we protect our children from undue suffering. He protects us from undue suffering. And you go through childhood and an adolescent experience of arrogance where you think that nothing can happen to you. <laughs> but if you've got a heart for God and you don't stagnate like the Israelis in the wilderness and live a lie and continue and you know in other words freeze your K through 6 mentality then you all of a sudden find out that there are some traumatic passages in life. Gail Sheehy wrote a book called Passages. And we have many passages, and some of them are major ones. Like, for example, the crisis of midlife is a time of major passage for many men in particular. And so we find that there are some times of passages, and one of them is that we find out that there's a cross to bear. And there's some dying to be done in order that there be resurrection power. And that if the new wine of the kingdom is going to flow, then there has to be a wine press. And there has to be crushed grapes. And, uh, of course, God is after the new wine of the kingdom that it might flow out of us. Now, with that in mind, I want to go back through and look at what preceded this dream. Now, this is on page 21 in my journal. And uh, I like a nice, quiet morning class like this because I can just kind of let this thing unfold in a rather unique, comfortable fashion, I think, and go back and see what revelations had preceded this. I had been studying... Carl Jung's brilliant piece of work, and it's a difficult piece, which I don't generally recommend to people unless they feel strongly urged to the spirit of, to study it, but it's called Transformation Symbolism in the Mass. And it's the greatest essay that I've ever read on the Mass or on the Eucharist or on communion. And of course, you know that uh, wine is a central thing there. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And uh, God has said to us, don't be under the influence of wine, but be under the influence of the Spirit, who is like wine, is the implication, and who will change your general consciousness, just like wine changes our consciousness. I said to a doctor one time years ago when I was beginning to drink wine after my rigid fundamentalist days, is it good to drink wine? He said, certainly it is, in moderation. He said it's particularly good when you go out to dinner. He was a very nice, quiet, laid-back, introverted type of fellow because it lowers your social defenses and enables you to carry on a more pleasant conversation. That came from a doctor many years ago, and that's true. And there are some people, we have a dear friend, who isn't able to really get out and discuss things unless they drink a glass of wine because it does uh, lower their social defenses. And we've had some of the best, most healing times at dinner with that person and many others like her. Uh, for that reason. Now, when you come to the celebration of the Lord's table, you know there are many different rites, different ways of doing this, one of which is called the Byzantine rite from the Byzantine churches. And I found that this was particularly fascinating, that when they observe the Lord's table, they break the host or the bread or the wafer into four pieces deliberately, the priest does this, and there are letters printed on each piece. Now, why four? Because four has a very central place in the Bible. You know, there were four rivers that flowed out of the Garden of Eden, right? The city lies four square. The cherubim, four, say. And basically, it has to do what it uh, has to do with in mythology and the mysticism of peoples all over the world, namely with knowing where you are, with getting your direction, with being fixed. The city lies four square, for example. You know, very important for people to have a sense of orientation. You know that. And when the Salesian missionaries went uh, to the Barraro tribesmen in Brazil, they had their villages laid out in quadrangles. 
interestingly, just like the city of Rome was laid out. The told it was plowed that way and then with a circle around it. And people didn't do that. The, the place right in the center where there, there was an intersection of the axis of these two lines was the sacred part of the city. It was called the navel of the earth. And they were able to orient themselves, not only physically, but spiritually. They felt at home in their city. You see what I'm saying? And so four is always, for example, to the American Indians, a very sacred number, because it has to do with the four great directions. Now, four here has to do with something even more important, and that is with the death, resurrection, glorification, and reigning of Christ. And he uses four different uh, Latin terms here to describe that. Uh, Mors, resurrectio, gloria, and regnum. The death, resurrection, glorification, and reign of Christ. So four, when in the Byzantine rite, the priest breaks it into four pieces, it has an ancient tradition connected with it, that this is a symbol of the glorified Christ, which is terrific, which is what we Christians need to get our direction. Because we have here, what? No continuing city, right? But we seek one to come. Abraham looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Now, people always feel kind of homeless wanderers, and especially believers, until they can get rooted and grounded in the glorified Christ. And we are then the new Jerusalem. We identify with that city of God, see? So that we feel a sense of coming home when we begin to understand something to the glory of Christ. And so that's very important now. When I had the dream of being on the mountain and finding the grapes hidden in the rock, what God was telling me was, this is the best fruit that you've ever seen. This is high place, high country fruit. This is summit revelation. Make all things according to the pattern that showed to you in the mount, which has to do with the heart. Because you know that as Abraham adventured, he never found that city here. You only find it in your heart. And we are already come, Hebrews 12, 22, to the Mount Zion. We are already come to the city of the living God. Not we're going to, but we are in our spirit, seated together in heavenly places in Christ. But it's one thing to, for me to sit here and quote that this morning. It's another thing to have a sense of reality about it that ever deepens within you. And I can say this at this stage in my spiritual journey, and I trust that you've tasted something of this, that that is the reality that cannot be shaken. We've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. You have something real that you know is real. Now, everything else as you walk on with God, and particularly if you're committed once for all to Him, as the Bible commands us to once for all submit ourselves a living sacrifice, our bodies a living sacrifice that if you've taken that once for all commitment as a child of God to the Lordship of Christ, and you are on a spiritual quest, then you know that everything else around you, because he says, yet once more I'm going to shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And we're living in a day when we see things being shaken utterly. Things that once worked, that everyone knew would work, don't work anymore. Institutions that once satisfied don't satisfy anymore. And so you have a lot of people at loose ends because everything is being shaken down. And we, many of us in this room, I'm sure, have had some great shaking in our lives. I know that from personal experience with some of you. And I know it's certainly true with us. And we don't like the shaking. And we wonder where the meaning is. And I'll tell you this, your head can never find it. Your head will never find it. Your mind can never find it. In fact, there was a truck driver who, with his wife, and our van that's sitting out there in the yard, she's an auto dealer and has been for years. She's the one who got us our van. We bought it from her. And her husband drives a big 18-wheeler. Big rough and ready fellow. But a guy who loves God, teaches a Bible class in his home, Syracuse, New York, where there isn't too much going on spiritually. Thank God today there's great hunger everywhere here in the East and the Northeast. But out there in Syracuse, uh, the, uh, the good infection hasn't hit full course yet. I think it will someday, but it hasn't yet. But he teaches a Bible class. It has a good turnout. 
But while he was driving from Syracuse to Ithaca, New York, which I guess usually takes about an hour, he said the trip seemed like five minutes because he was in a trance. Now, this is a truck driver who doesn't usually have visions, but he had a vision. And the vision that he had, his name is Steve Grove, was that he saw a long line of people, a huge crowd of people, jostling one another to get to the front of the line. He wondered what was at the front of the line. And so he finally saw in his vision what was at the head of the line, and it was an angel with four heads, a cherubim, which you've seen in Scripture, you know, a lion, uh, a bull, an eagle, and a man. Remember that? A cherubim, what they look like? And he said, people wanted to get to that angel. And I said, for what purpose? The angel had a huge sword. And he said he was astounded that people were pushing one another out of line to get there first. Because when they got there, the angel would simply say, Ascent. And they would nod or say yes, and he'd cut their head off. And uh, he said, I wonder what in the world that means. Well, I leaped for joy when I heard it, because I knew what it meant. Of course, that's the perfect picture of death. You don't live too long, and you don't have a head. <laughs> and you know how much the Bible says always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And he'd given me a complimentary dream, which I won't go into when I went into that area, and was in the middle of my itinerary saying this, there are a lot of people that are ready to die and be resurrected because you don't stay dead. Thank God that is a fact. You don't stay dead. We die in order that we might rise. We don't major on the morbid and, and the negative, but the thing is that it's very significant <clears throat> that the angel was cutting off the heads because of course in three dimensions down here we live 99 percent of the time out of what's above our neckties so to speak or our collars and between our ears and we're not much in touch with the shall we say nine tenths of the iceberg that's out of sight which is the unconscious which the bible calls the heart right or which the psychologist calls the collective unconscious and or the unconscious and we're not much in touch with that. We don't really know what's going on, so to speak, downstairs. And so we live all of our time this rational, goal-setting, goal-pursuing, achieving type of masculine intellect. And so the angel was cutting off the heads because the Bible clearly says, Jesus prayed it, Father, I thank you, you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and you've revealed them to babes, revealed them to babes. Where does revelation come? I'll put my law in your heart. And that's where he shines forth, is in our heart. Now the thing is, the glory of God, four. The glorified Christ, four. That's what the wafer was broken into four pieces for. Very definitely is a symbol of Christ risen and glorified and reigning. Now, how do you get at the glorified Christ? How do you get in touch with the glorified Christ? Well, take a look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, please. Remember, when Moses was on top of the mountain, and very parallel to the dream that I had of grapes hidden in the rock, from whence comes the best wine, God said, see that you make everything according to the pattern showed to you in the mount. Now, I'm not going to take time to read this whole passage this morning. You can do it if you like when you have time. But everything that goes before here, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he, Moses is the illustration. Moses is the illustration here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And what is said here is that if you wanted to see glory in the old economy before the cross, for those 1400 years before that you'd have to live in Moses day to see it just during Moses lifespan why because he was the one sole person out of a small nation on the face of the earth who had the right to go into the temple holy of holies at any time that he so desired now his brother Aaron the high priest couldn't do that he could only go in on October 10th into the holy of holies where the Shekinah glory was right and isn't it interesting that the holy of holies was a perfect cube just like the holy city is uh, lies four square 
Uh, the holy city is 1,500 furlongs by 1,500 furlongs by 1,500 furlongs. And the holy of holies was 15 cubits by 15 cubits by 15 cubits. It was a perfect square. And so again, you have that idea of four, or a cube, say. Well, that's where the Shekinah glory of God was, and Aaron couldn't go in there any time he wanted to. He could only go in on what we know as October 10th as the Day of Atonement. But Moses could go in any time he wanted to, and when he came out, his face was shining. Remember that? He put a veil over his face because the glory began to fade until he went back into the presence of God and got a fresh recharge, so to speak. Now, that's the illustration here in the third chapter. <clears throat> Notice what happens on both sides of that illustration. In verse 3, you are always showing that you are a letter of Christ. We're the best translation. Now, I love the Williams translation, which I'm using this morning. We have many good NIV and all kinds of good translations today. Uh, different people like different translations. But the best translation is the living translation, you and me. We're God's epistle. He is not particularly interested in a new translation of the Bible. I feel sure of that. We have translated and retranslated and retranslated. Unless it is a two-legged translation. You and me. We're the ones that count. This is where the world, you can't get the world by and large to read the Bible. Once in a while you can, but you can't usually, can you? Now, those who've tried know full well you can't. But I'll tell you, they are attracted by people who have something, aren't they? They are attracted. For example, when we were in Israel, the head waiter in the dining room at the Tiberius Plaza Hotel was a beautiful Arab Muslim boy by the name of Diab, and I'll tell you, his face lit up the whole dining room. He, he just had a magnificent smile. But the glory that was in us attracted what was in his heart, and so we had a unique experience. For the first time in his life, he invited strangers, Wayne and Judy Monblow and Trudy and myself, to his parents' Bedouin tent. And we went to their tent up in the hills above Haifa and had a magnificent feast in a Bedouin tent that wasn't too much different from Abraham's day. It was very like the tent that Abraham must have lived in. Now things are beginning to change. There were a few signs of change there, but it's still the same old tent with the breeze blowing through on the hill and set just right so that you'd get maximum natural ventilation in that hot land. And uh, uh, of course they dress the way they do because that's the best way to dress to keep cool in the land. We think that, well, we've got our light t-shirts and the rest of it, but that's not true. Even the uh, Druzes, who uh, wear long black robes, the men, they stay cooler than Westerners do. I asked the Arabs, uh, which is cooler, Western dress or your old traditional dress? And every time they say the traditional dress. But what attracted us to this wonderful experience? And he said, because I think of you as brothers. And this was a beautiful young man. And uh, when we were ready to pull away from the hotel, he came charging out. And Nice uh, uniform. This was a Canadian Pacific Hotel there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Excellent hotel, and he came charging out with a huge basket. And I do mean a huge basket of fruit. And, of course, Israel is blessed with uh, wonderful fruit. And he said, here, take this with you for the journey. And he just blessed us at every turn of the road. That's the letters. That's the epistle that God's interested in. When Christ is lifted up, when he's unveiled in this living letter, he draws men to him. Now remember, the child is set for the rising and falling of many. That's where we began with Simeon's message to Mary in particular. And a sword will pierce your heart. And the thoughts of many hearts and intentions of many hearts will thus be revealed through this painful experience of being opened up. Well, keep that in mind, because he says here in 2 Corinthians 3.3, you are always showing that you're a letter of Christ, produced by my service. Written not in ink, please notice that. I am more and more strongly led to the Spirit of God to knock a disease that evangelicals have, bibliolatry. I love the Bible. I've memorized large portions of it. When I was a young man, I began memorizing, memorized from Romans through Revelation. But I'll tell you right now, while we should be saturated in the Scriptures, know what the Word of God says, and read it. And I used to read it through three times a year until it was second nature to me. Nevertheless, Christ is not locked between leather covers. And many Christians think that he is. 
and they think that it's what their mind thinks about the scriptures. And that's why we have so many divisions, and that's why we're so uptight and, frankly, neurotic and rigid and driven in our constructs and concepts is because what I think about the Bible must not be violated, else God will fall off his throne. I'll lose the image of God. That simply is not the case. I said to someone who was very uptight like that <coughs> not very long ago, listen, God's been sitting out there in a new Jerusalem on his throne all these thousands of years while human history has unfolded, and he's let every conceivable atrocity go on on this planet and all kinds of storms and everything else, and he isn't uptight. Why are you uptight, say? Well, in my earlier days, I wouldn't have said that because I didn't know that God. Now I can rest a whole lot more because I'm not defending him and I'm not holding him up. He's defending me and holding me up, and that's a much better position to be in. And you don't have to defend God and be uptight, at, but you will. Every one of us will as long as we're stuck in our bibliometry, as long as we think that it's my constructs and my ideas about the Bible and my doctrinal state and my creed which at all costs must be defended. Because if you let God start opening you up, you find out that the Bible is full of paradoxes, seeming contradictions, which God himself put in there. I spoke strongly on that in Philadelphia, to stretch our spirits. Now, if you let him take away those constructs and tear down, and he will, in any willing heart, and as a matter of fact, whether hearts are willing or not, the day is coming when he's going to shake them down anyway. I'd rather be willing to have them shaken down earlier. <clears throat> because a lot of these things are going to collapse. And things that we thought worked didn't work, and, and reality hits us full in the face. And each one of us get it that way many times because we're so stubborn we won't let go of things, or frightened that we won't let go of things. And so he tears down some of these things, and then greater peace, greater rest, greater certainty comes, but it comes inwardly, and it's God himself that gives it to you, and you feel more secure than at home in the universe. Isn't that interesting that it says in Hebrews 4 that there remains a rest under the people of God, a rest for the people of God now, not for sinners, he's talking to Jewish Christians there, 30 years after Pentecost, there remains a rest of the people of God, he just said if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have spoken of another day, but there remains a rest under the people of God, that's us. He that would enter into his rest must cease from his own works, struggling and striving, as God did from his. So let us labor to enter into this rest. And then it says this, for the word of God is life-giving, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. There's that sword again, see piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. Isn't it strange that spiritual surgery brings us to rest? I have a tape that I did quite a while back called A Restful Trip to the Operating Room. None of us think that operations are basically comforting. But God says, if you want to have rest, then let me cut out of your life and open up your life to the light and the very thing you're seeking but fighting will come to you. And it's a fact that it does come to us. That through our conflicts, the reason we suffer is because we think we know better. And certainly God would never do this, or God is not like this, and this is not the way it should be. And the whole thing gets kicked into a cocked hat, you know, upside down, head over heels. And all of a sudden, in a place where you least expected to find God, you find God. Through personal experience. And so you're... These things have already been knocked from your hand or shaken down, and you don't seek to take hold of them again. You don't need to. You know, when I began to adventure in my own prophetic calling, I, for a long time, got anti-conservative dreams, is what I'd label them. God kept telling me everybody else thought I was plenty radical. I thought I was plenty radical, but my dreams kept telling me you're not nearly radical enough. You're not moving fast enough. You're not where I want you on the cutting edge. Now, thank God I haven't had any of those dreams for a long time. Lord being the jokester that he is, I suppose he'll give me one tonight, but I haven't had one for a long time, which leads me to believe that I'm where I should be in, in the things that I'm saying. So we need to get knocked out of our mental constructs. Please look at 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 again. You're the letter of Christ produced by my service, written not in ink. Now, if letters written in ink could have done the job, and I'll show you what I mean here. Then... Why wouldn't the pious Jews of the Old Testament have done it? 
They were people of the letter, devout, pious, dedicated people, totally, utterly, to this day, like our friend Gideon, dedicated to the Torah. But instead, they can't see Jesus for being. They can't see Messiah when he stands before them, fulfilling all the prophecies. How do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that every living voice, Jesus indicted them, you've killed all the prophets almost without exception. And all the blood from righteous Abel to Zacharias will come on this generation. What generation was that? That was a generation that knew the Torah. These were not people who professed to be God's enemies. They weren't a local communist party of atheists. These were people who were deep students of the letter of Scripture. How about that? Who had not only a large written, but also a large oral tradition, plus a deep vein of mysticism in the Kabbalah. So they had all of these things for centuries. And yet when God stood before them, they couldn't see him. They didn't know him. Why? Because they were wholly identified with a letter that kills. Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. The spirit that quickeneth, the letter kills, right? That's what you have here. Now, for example, if you'd been living in that day, supposing you heard this little Jew with poor eyesight running around preaching everywhere with great fervor, who had once been an outstanding rabbi, don't circumcise your children. Supposing you lived 2,000 years ago, put yourself in that context. And supposing you heard him say, eat anything you want, have all the pork chops you want. And I say to you that if you circumcise your children, Christ will profit you nothing. That's exactly what he preached, isn't it? You could say to him, as a devout servant of God in that day who knew the scriptures and the only existent, extant scriptures, where's your chapter and verse? How about that? Or you could say to Peter when he came back from the household of Cornelius after eight years after Pentecost, why did you go into men uncircumcised and eat with them? That's contrary to our traditions. And wh where could they say, well, <clears throat> it says in Acts chapter 8, there was no Acts chapter 8 or 10. See? There wasn't any Galatians 5 2. They had no scriptures to stand on. What did they say? God made me do it. <laughs> the Spirit told me to do it. What I'd like to have you see is that every time the authority of the Spirit transcended the authority of the written word. Every blessed time. That's a very radical thought, which Christians to this day resist. Right? Now, that's what I mean, see. Peter eating pork chops got pressure from James in Galatians, the second chapter, the last part of the chapter. What are you doing? You're a Jew. It's okay for these Gentiles to do this after the church council. Why are you doing this? And so Peter, because of peer pressure, discreetly refused to eat with the Gentiles until Paul challenged him and said, why aren't you walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel? On what basis did he dare challenge him? Why did Peter dare go into the house of Gentiles and eat pork because God let down a sheet on the roof and told him to. But all he had was a report of a vision that God had given him. He did not have chapter and verse. Now we have churches today and seminaries that spend all the blessed time on chapter and verse. That's where we've gotten hung up. Bibliolatry. The letter that kills. And so as a result we get hard and we're ready to fight with anybody who doesn't agree with us right to the last a jot and tittle, and it frightens the daylights out of us to have somebody bring anything outside of the pale of our understanding, and it's because we have not learned the deep certainty and peace and rest of a living God in whom we live and move and have our being, who leads us constantly, constantly, as he did Peter and as he did James and John and everybody else, outside the perimeters of our usual experience. Now, there are some adventurers here in the room this morning, I know from personal experience, who've been led outside the perimeters of their personal experience, beyond the taboos, right? For example, in my early days, if somebody had told me, someday you'll, because I was a rigid fundamentalist and brought up and brainwashed that way from the time I could remember anything. Somebody told me you preach in Roman Catholic churches and have many Jews as your friends, I said, you're out of your mind. The day came when I not only preached in Roman Catholic churches, rather continuously, and to Catholic groups, and I love my brothers and sisters, and labels mean nothing anymore. Not only so, 
But the Eucharist means more to me than it ever has in my whole life. And I'm from a non-liturgical background. God makes great changes, doesn't he? And I have also had the joy of marrying a Protestant minister who was divorced to a lovely Catholic girl at the altar in St. Peter's with a Roman Catholic priest joining me in the service alongside with both of us standing there in full regalia. Now, that's a day of change, isn't it? When you're led through the taboos, the one great sin that cannot be forgiven in certain evangelical circles is divorce. Well, I knew God wanted me to marry Wayne Monblow to Judy Monblow at the altar in St. Peter's. I hadn't, I've never had one ray of doubt about that at all. That's a well-known fact to thousands of people. Everybody in the broadcast knows that. And I'm glad that God's broken through some of these ridiculous old barriers and taboos, but as long as you have your head stuck in the letter, it kills so that the Spirit cannot get through and do what he wants to. Now, the only way the Spirit can get through, and that's what we want to see here. <clears throat> Verse 3 again. For you are always showing that you are a letter of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 3. Produced by my service, written not in ink. Not in ink. But by the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone. May I paraphrase and say, not on India paper either. But where? On human hearts. Now, come down to this glory business here. And verse 15. And Moses is the illustration. And when he came down off the mountain or out of the temple, his face was shining. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil hangs over what? Not their heads, but their hearts. Where was the veil? The veil was between the holy place, the really significant veil, and the holy of holies, right? No human hands could tear it. It was incredibly thick. In fact, we looked at the model of the uh, temple, the model of the whole city. Did you see that when you were... And, uh, I was glad to see the artists and the architects' representation of what they thought the Holy of Holies was like in Herod's temple, Restoration Temple. It was a huge thing. Uh, stood higher than the rest of the temple. So that veil must have really been something. There stood the veil between the sacred spot where the high priest could go once a year, where the Shekinah glory of God was to abide. And the ministry of the holy place where the priest could go and minister any time and not the common person so a veil hangs over where is the sanctuary the sanctuary is the spirit your body is the temple of the holy spirit who is the new wine who comes from the wine press from the crushed grapes he dwells where his spirit bears witness with our spirit this is the deepest part of our being, so to speak. So, verse 15, when Moses has read, a veil hangs over their hearts. But, whenever the heart turns to the Lord, get that please, whenever the heart turns to the Lord, very important, when the heart turns to the Lord, now, when, not when the heart turns to the church as an institution, or when the heart goes to church, or when the heart turns to the Bible doesn't say that either, does it? It says, when your deepest inner being turns to the Lord, what happens? The veil is removed. Now, the thing is that how did Jesus deal with the veil in the model, which are shadows, for what we now have the substance of? He dealt with it through suffering, right? When he's hanging on the cross, and he shouted, it is finished. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. What is this? This is a living word from the dying Christ. Now, what is this living word from the dying Christ? It is finished. You know, you read in the book of the Revelation, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, right? And so when he was hanging on the cross out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. He wasn't smiting the nations then. He was opening the way into his presence. And when he shouted a living word from the cross, it is finished. Based on his pronouncement that the work was finished, the veil in the temple 
which human hands could never rend, was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the way into the holiest was made manifest, unveiled, opened, where the glory of God was, symbolically saying, welcome everyone. Not just a special man once a year. Not just a special few Israelis standing around, relatively speaking, outside. But everyone is welcome into the heart of God. That's why it says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. So when his flesh was rent, and the glory came out, so that even in the model, the temple, so to speak, the veil was rent, and we had a right into the glory of God, an entree to an experience of the glorified God and the glorified Christ as a result of the living word. What does it take to rend? When, a, when the heart turns to the Lord, we get a living word that rends the veil that keeps us from touching the living Christ otherwise. See? When we are turned away from God, which we do, you know what the Jews did to that veil? They sewed it back up according to tradition. Crazy people. We're just as crazy. We do the same thing. We turn from our contact with the living God too frequently. Because we're used to doing that, aren't we? We're used to living our own independent ego path. So, shall we say, that the trick of walking in the Spirit, so to speak, is to constantly turn to God. Or, as Brother Lawrence put it, to practice the presence of God. To talk with Him, not to postpone, but to talk with Him all day long, whenever you're distressed, whenever. In the middle of the night, sitting in a bathtub, driving down the street, riding in a taxi, sitting in university class, doesn't matter, washing dishes. Turn to God then. Right then, He's closer than your skin. Now, that's why he said to Christians, don't walk like the Gentiles in the emptiness of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being cut off in the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because their hearts are blind. Whenever our hearts turn away from God, darkness. And God doesn't seem real and he doesn't seem there. I do that too frequently. Now, I don't do it nearly as frequently as I used to because I'm picking up the habit of turning to God. But when I do, I get myself worked into a tremendous lavish. I was reading the other day in one of Norman Grubb's excellent books, Yes, I Am. He said this, Whenever my heart is disturbed, I know that I'm off-center. Good word, good word. So when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Then what happens? Verse 17. Now the Lord means the Spirit, and whenever, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with faces uncovered, He's talking about the face of the heart. The veil is over the heart, see? But now it's uncovered, the face of the heart. Because we continue to reflect like mirrors, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into likeness to him from one degree of splendor to another. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We all, as King James beautifully puts it, with unveiled faith, Beholding and reflecting, as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, are gradually changed into the same image from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're gradually transformed. It's the living voice of God, not the written word of God, that takes the veil off your heart. And so when Simeon said, a sword shall pierce your own heart, and the thoughts and intentions of many hearts will thus be revealed, when God can get the veil off our heart and the glory starts flowing out and shining out, then that glory is also love. And people then have the courage to be who God created them to be because you've had the courage to be who God created you to be. And you find out who you really are when you come out with God's glory on you. Now here's a statement that comes from an ancient mystic, and he says this, the sword, and you remember how prominent the sword is in the ancient myth, as for example Excalibur, which is a terrific movie, it was out a while back, 
but it's based on a legend, the most modern myth that's been around since the 12th century. That's the most modern myth of Western man. Myths do not mean something that's untrue. Myths are carriers of great truth. And you remember that only King Arthur, no matter how many strong men came to try to pull the sword out of the rock, that only the true king had a right to pull the sword out of the rock. Even when he was a boy, he pulled the sword out of the rock. Now, our ego, time and again, would like to use the sword. Power. But only the king in us, only the child, this child that's in us, the child has been born in you, right? Only the child has the right to pull the sword from the rock, the Christ who's within. He's the only one who knows how to use power. He's the only one who has, because of his royalty, the right to use that sword. And you'll know who he is because he has the sword that can take the veil down. And you remember what Simeon said to Mary, this child is destined for the rising and falling of many in Israel. And because of him, a sword will pierce your heart, and the thoughts and intentions of many hearts will be revealed. That's absolutely essential to the healing of mankind. That is our ministry, is to get out of our heads and let God lead us into our larger being and discover that Christ has been born in the Bethlehem of our inner being, my little children of whom I am in birth pangs again till Christ be formed in you. Now when I teach these things this morning, I know full well that to nature it terrifies me. It brings fear and resistance because none of us like this by nature because we know that this means being opened up and discovering some things, that frightens anyone. Transparency always frightens any of us because we're sinners and we don't like transparency. But that's exactly what the church is called to be. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. A light to the Gentiles. And this child who's within us, as he was within Mary, we receive the same word from Simeon, that this child is set for the rising and falling of many. And I'll tell you, it puts power in your life, but it's his power used for his purpose and to his glory not for ego purposes. And ego becomes a servant of the divine. We become his servant and become so much with him that you don't know, and this is beautiful, where he leaves off and you begin. And that's what God told me one night in the night about the Eucharist. He said, what happens to bread when you eat it? And I'd been asking him for ways to explain our unity and our oneness and our union with Christ. And I had an aha moment right in the middle of the night. I said, why, it becomes so inextricably a part of me that I don't know where the wafer leaves off, and I begin after I eat. He said, that's the way it is with Christ in you. You don't know where he begins and when, where you leave off and where he begins. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why they broke away from four, because we have a glorified Christ within us. And when the heart turns to the Lord, that is... A relatively simple thing to do and yet very difficult paradoxically because we're so accustomed to doing our own thing but when the heart turns to the Lord the veil is taken away so here's what Hippolyta said years ago the sword is very much more than the instrument which divides it is itself the force which turns from something small into something great it is the transformation of the vital spirit in man into the divine. God uses that sword to open us up. Now I'll conclude with this. Because it's the luster of everything I've been talking about this morning. When I was speaking out in Long Island recently, the cost for Christ. Two brethren came up to me afterward. And I can pick up the vibrations of brethren like this quite easily anymore from a long distance off. And I uh, thus have my uh, guard up. 
and they said, uh, we have a couple questions we'd like to ask you. We're from such and such, and then they garbled the church. I said, wait a minute, what church are you from? I made them speak it distinctly. And I believe that these fellows had basically uh, good hearts after I finished working with them. But when I talk about the fear that all of us experience, I could sense that fear in them. They said, you spoke over the radio and you mentioned that you had a dream in which you saw a serpent. And the serpent's eyes had the wisdom of the ages. What did you mean by that? I said, I meant what I said. I said, I know that many Christians, when they see a serpent in their dream, think that they're certainly first cousin to the devil and deeply in cahoots with the evil one. The serpents always symbolize Satan. That's because Christians have not listened to what God would say to them from history. That was not always historically true. That happens to be a more modern disease of modern evangelicalism and modern charismatic evangelicalism. So I said, do you remember what Jesus said? As Moses lifted up the serpent. That old serpent called the devil and Satan? Oh no. Certainly the serpent can be a symbol of total evil. He is that old serpent called the devil and Satan, as the book of the Revelation says. But you know what Jesus said about the serpent? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must I be lifted up. And he likened himself to a serpent. But whosoever believes may have everlasting life. Whoever looked at the serpent in Moses' day was healed, right? What does that tell you? When God starts expanding our spiritual consciousness to discover who we are, and he draws our hearts to him and takes the veil away, then we're able to see some new things, namely that the serpent doesn't always mean evil, for example, that it can mean absolute goodness, that it can mean healing. And when you pass a medical building or you look on a nurse's pen, what do you see? A caduceus. Two serpents intertwined on a cross. A caduceus, a healing staff. It's a symbol of healing to this day. You know where it comes from? Mercurius. You know who Mercurius was? He was the messenger of the gods in ancient mythology. He was the one who brought revelation and healing. Isn't that interesting? See, God can tell you all kinds of things. He speaks all the time everywhere. Do you think God only spoke? I love what my friend Clinton White used to say. In the beginning was the word. Do you think that there was a King James hanging out in space? He speaks all the time everywhere. He's always spoken to men. And the Bible makes that abundantly clear if we had ears to hear it and eyes to see it. And so I said to those brethren, the dream that God gave me was a healing serpent. And it did have the wisdom of the age. It's when your serpents come up from under the ground. That's why God uses serpents as symbols. When they're underground, they're a menace. And they do you all kinds of damage when they're in your unconscious part and you don't know what's going on, but when they begin to surface and they're lifted up as Moses lifted up and you look at the things that have been bugging you and they're brought into the light, they bring healing. And they said, oh, and I think it began to score on them, thank God. And you know why it began to score? Because it wouldn't back up an inch. It takes a long time in the fire for some of us to get the courage to stop being intimidated by the institution. And to stand and say what God told us to say without equivocation and without compromise. You know, God gave me a dream one time when which I heard a great voice. It was one of the greatest dreams I ever had. And it was a time when I brought all kinds of psychosomatic illness on myself because I was way off the track and way out of center. And in this dream, I had the dream in the afternoon when I took a nap, and I never remember my dreams if I have any when I take a nap in the afternoon, only at night. But in this dream, I was in a great control room, like I had seen at Cape Canaveral in Florida, in the Kennedy Space Center, where there are banks of instruments and death. You've seen that on television if you haven't seen it at uh, Cape uh, Canaveral itself. And there was magnificent electronic ultra-futuristic music playing in the background of this. This was a great dream. Ultra-futuristic music. And there was a countdown in tongues. 
but I knew it wasn't to the launching of a miss, uh, missile. It was to the appearance of deity. 